it started with a man. Pompeo Coy turns out to be the Jonathan Swift slash Cervantes slash William Shakespeare of video games. Who wanted to take gaming on the go. It was Yokoi's team that looked at miniaturization. Everything the NES does, we can do in this little handheld unit. He met with his share of disappointment. It's a cool invention, great thought, probably not a good idea at the end of the day. Gunpei Okoi was in the doghouse at this point. His system had bombed. Stop. And created something that exceeded everyone's expectations. The GBA is definitely the most successful console in the history of mankind. This is the story behind the best-selling game system ever created and the man behind it. It's the story of Nintendo Game Boy. Game Boy doesn't just lead the handheld gaming market. It owns it. The year is 1965, and a successful entrepreneur named Hiroshi Yamauchi is at the head of a playing card manufacturer named Nintendo. At the time, uh, Nintendo was completely and totally run by Mr. Yamauchi. Um, he made all the decisions, and any decision made by anyone else was always run by him for approval or for his own take on it. He's a very stern businessman, very shrewd, very smart. I would say he's, you know, he is a genius, uh, but a tough businessman. Yamauchi-san is a hard ass. I think that's the best way to describe his style of management. Well, he was one of the early pioneers at Nintendo. That man demanded a lot from his troop and from his team. But at the time, he was 100% you know, in control of every detail, and so everything had to go through him. And a young technician from Kyoto comes on board to maintain Nintendo's factory machinery. Their plant technician, the guy who made sure that the assembly belt was working properly and that the plant equipment was working properly was this guy named Gunpei Yokoi. Quiet guy, unassuming guy, very smart guy, very loyal, dedicated guy, who at night liked to go home and experiment at making toys. It's not long before Gunpei's experimenting gets him noticed. Yamauchi came to him and said, do you think you could make a toy for us to sell? Now in America, we'd say, sure, what's in it for me? That didn't occur to Gunpei Okoi. He said, sure. And he came back with some of the inventions he'd made. His first invention was like this mechanical arm that like was basically just would grab things. And that was one of the early things that he, he developed for Nintendo and it sold pretty well. The toy, called the Ultra Hand, is released in 1970 and sells over a million units that holiday season. Toys didn't have to be brilliant back then. They just had to be simple and fun and easy to manufacture. And this was in the pre-Japan taking over the world period. So there wasn't a lot of money. Cheap was good. Yokoi's toys worked well. They sold well. But Yamauchi saw that there was something special about Yokoi, that he had a great creativity. You know, the other thing that, that's really remarkable about Yokoi, he was very charismatic. Gunpei Yokoi turns out to be the Jonathan Swift slash Cervantes slash William Shakespeare of video games. On August 28, 1980, Yo, out, Nintendo releases another of Gunpei Yokoi's inventions, the Game & Watch. So in the beginning, he came up with the Game & Watch unit and made himself a name at Nintendo. And he kind of expanded that product as the years passed. You know, he added a, a two-screen Game & Watch unit. It was very popular. This was the period where Mattel and Coleco were battling with light diode football games and racing games. And here, using LCD screens, they added a little more image to them. Nintendo wasn't the only company doing these at the time. A number of companies did. Time out electronic games from Mego. All tell time and are so slim, you'll play them anywhere. <laughs> the Nintendo units were usually a little more expensive, but they were usually a little better made and they were a little more creative. With classics such as Manhole and Donkey Kong, the Game & Watch line continues for nearly 10 years, selling more than 40 million units. Yokoi becomes a star player at Nintendo. My understanding was that Gunpei Yokoi really had Yamauchi's ear. That when Yokoi suggested something, you know, the engineers were always behind him. He delivered on what he said he could do, always. Always, always, always. When he said he could make something, he made it. And he made it cheaply. And that was enough for Yamauchi. 
In 1983, Nintendo releases a video game console called the Famicom in Japan. It comes to the U.S. in 1985 as the Nintendo Entertainment System. The new console is a hit in both countries and will go on to sell 50 million units in its lifetime. Gunpei Yokoi turns his focus to bringing the power of the NES to the palm of your hand. Gunpei Yokoi came up with the idea for Game Boy. As far as the development goes, this was done out of his team. Stop. Gunpei Yokoi's R&D One team, which is also responsible for the NES classic Metroid, gets to work. The inspiration for Game Boy definitely was Game & Watch territory. It was basically taking console gaming and merging it with the whole Game & Watch handheld craze. What Yokoi doesn't realize is that their little NES has a big future. In 1989, Gunpei Yokoi is finishing up work on a special project. The motivation to create Game Boy was that the NES or the Famicom was a world power. Nintendo owned between 93 and 97 percent of the world console market by 1989, and the world console market was huge. It was huge. So they said, well, look, here's a chance for us to go from just this little piece of business to a much bigger piece of business. Portable Game Boy is launched with an initial selling price of $169.99. Game Boy had a worldwide launch. Game Boys almost always have had worldwide launches. The launch of Game Boy was tremendous. The world was in love with Nintendo. The United States was in love with Nintendo. It was an immediate hit. It came out, people bought it, it immediately expanded their business. And the Game Boy has an unstoppable ally, a game called Tetris. The initial success of the Game Boy was due to Tetris, a fantastic game and a brilliant business decision for Nintendo to bundle it. Tetris was very, very instrumental to the success of the Game Boy, simply because it was on the Game Boy at the right time. I wouldn't say that the Game Boy wouldn't be what it is today had it not been for Tetris, but it certainly helped really jumpstart and accelerate the, the Game Boy audience growth. They had Tetris, you can't underestimate that as, you know, sort of a factor in the original Game Boy's success. Nintendo also has a stable of NES games that are perfect for the Game Boy. When Game Boy launched, Nintendo went back to the well a little bit. NES had come out in America in 1985, 86 was when it went coast to coast. And it, it had NES baseball, it had a NES tennis, there was a golf game. Nintendo went back to a lot of these very easy games and ported them over to Game Boy. But the launch titles looked an awful lot like launch titles for the NES. But it doesn't take long for competition to appear. Atari came out with Lynx at the same time that Game Boy came out, and they had to be thanking their lucky stars over at Atari because, you know, here comes Game Boy, little tiny screen, black and white, very low resolution. They said, you know, they'd, they'd gotten to go see a demonstration of Game Boy. I want Game Boy. And they laughed and laughed and laughed till they cried because the thing was so pathetic. What they didn't realize and what Nintendo has always focused on was if you're going to play a portable game, people are thinking cheap. They're thinking convenient. One of the key advantages of the Game Boy was that it was low cost and that it didn't have any moving parts in it. So there wasn't a disk drive or anything. It was all cartridge based and it didn't have a light in it. So you could play Game Boy games for a very long time. And that's very important for the target group of the Game Boy. It was kids. You could take out a Lynx and play for you know, two hours maybe. And you would have to uh, either carry some spare batteries or run back home and get some. And for going on trips or being on a long bus ride and a train ride, it, it just wasn't feasible. Although the Lynx was technically a more powerful system, it quickly finds itself in bargain bins. While Game Boy sales continue to climb. In 1991, Sega and NEC also enter the handheld market. Game Gear was similar in that it had a really cool screen. You could even watch TV on it. It just looked great. But in order for the screen to be that great, it had to be powered by a lot of battery power. And that meant that the batteries didn't last very long. And then at the same time, NEC came out with its Turbo Express. Again, a better screen, color screen, backlit screen, but it's playing actual console games. But the problem is both of these units cost more than Game Boy. Even though the NEC Turbo Express played console games, the library was nowhere near the size of the Game Boy library. 
and you gotta harp on the battery life again. Thanks to longer battery life, a larger selection of great games, and a cheaper price point, the Game Boy comes out on top, selling 32 million units by 1992. Meanwhile, the Lynx, Game Gear, and Turbo Express become things of the past. But how much longer will a relatively simple Game Boy be able to stay on top? Nearly five years after its 1989 launch and more than 50 million units later, the Game Boy gets the first of many upgrades, the Super Game Boy. 1994, the first jump for Game Boy was the Super Game Boy. Super Game Boy was a peripheral that you could put in your Super NES that would let you play Game Boy games in a Super NES. Now, if you can think of anything that would be dumber, instead of playing these big, beautiful, full-color, highly detailed Super NES games, you could now play these $19 Game Boy games on your Super NES. It did not make a lot of sense. At the same time, Sega came out with 32X. It gave you more color, it gave you better sound, it gave you bigger games. That made sense. It made a lot of sense, right? So what happens? Sega sold 300,000 32Xs. Super Game Boy sales were in the millions, multiple millions. Who could figure out why? But people wanted to play their Game Boy games on the big TV. Jagged as they looked, it was pretty stupid stuff. But people bought it. They, they snatched it up. It brought some new life to the Game Boy. In 1995, color finally comes to the little handheld that could, but not in the form of a color screen. Another thing that brought new life was not Game Boy Color, but Color Game Boy. Game Boy came out in 1989. For a while, it was really hot, and then it became a backwater for a while. So they came out first with Color Game Boy. And I still remember Peter Main, the vice president of Nintendo, standing up at CES and saying, you know, you people are always asking, when are we going to come out with a Color Game Boy? Well, here it is. What Color Game Boy was, was Game Boys with colored outsides. You know, ha, 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 funny joke there, Peter. Weird as it sounds, people liked it. It brought Game Boy sales up. Go figure, just a different color outside Game Boy. The next step for the Game Boy was to become smaller. Six years after the original Game Boy came out, Nintendo released the Game Boy Pocket. What it was was kind of a, a tweaked version of the original system. Even though, you know, you might not immediately notice the contrast of the screen, the screen itself were, were just much better. You could see much more. The screen didn't blur as easily when you moved. So with this Pocket upgrade, you get a much smaller unit, a unit that used smaller batteries, something that you could put in your pocket and really bring along with you. It looks like Nintendo just can't lose. But that changes in 1995, when the father of Game Boy, Gunpei Yokoi, releases what will become Nintendo's biggest flop, the, the Virtual, Virtual Boy. He was interested in the experiment about, could you make games 3D? Could you actually make it so that instead of feeling like you were looking at an image, you were looking at an object? And that was kind of the impetus. The whole Virtual Boy debacle was, was a very interesting one, especially because I was privy to more information than, than many people. The Virtual Boy had very few redeeming features. It wasn't uh, proper 3D, it was only in red. It was attached to a tabletop and wasn't movable, it wasn't portable or lightweight or anything. There was just nothing redeeming about it. And the ultimate frustration for me was that they had a much better system in development that got canceled that might have been successful. You never know. But the Virtual Boy certainly had no chance of success with all its uh, unusual decisions that they had taken. It didn't really sell that well. People didn't really like it. It gave people a lot of headaches because you'd look into it and it was red, it was flickery, and if you played it for too long, I think your eyes might melt. <laughs> because you were staring at red and black and only red and black for a long time, people tended to get dizzy. If you played it for like more than an hour, when you looked away, you couldn't see red anymore. It's a cool invention, great thought, not, probably not a good idea at the end of the day. Because of the Virtual Boy's abysmal performance, Yokoi is left behind in favor of other designers. Kumpei Yokoi was in the doghouse at this point. His system had bombed. In corporate Japan, there's something called a window seat. And a window seat basically is you screwed up, you did something wrong, and instead of firing you or, or you know, reprimanding you every day or giving you uh, you know, another chance. They basically let you sit by the window and occupy you with something, but not really let you make decisions that affect the company. And that's exactly what happened to Yokoi. He got a window seat. So it was a pretty tough time. You have 
Yokoi, and they're leaving him with this disaster. They're saying, you are going to man this disaster, and you will be ignored. No one's going to come talk to you. You're going to be associated with this joke of a system while everyone else is going to, to look at our big N64, the system of the future. Gunpei's first big failure has him down, but his sights are set on starting something new. By 1996, Nintendo has grown bigger than ever, and with that growth comes a change in focus to bigger projects, such as the Nintendo 64. This powerful new system overshadows the failed Virtual Boy. In August of that year, Gunpei Yokoi decides to leave the Japanese gaming giant and start his own company. He was sitting there working on stuff that had no consequence, stuff that wouldn't make Nintendo a lot of money, wouldn't exactly change the world. So. Yokoi got bored and uh, in the end left the company. It wasn't too much longer that he started Koto. While he was at Koto, he did what he always did. He created a new game system, the Wonder Swan. Tragically, on October 4th, 1997, Gunpei Yokoi is struck and killed by a car in Japan. His death is felt throughout the industry. He was also a, a father and a husband and, and very much in love with his children. The name Gampa Yokoi was synonymous with handheld gaming. And for this person to get, you know, uh, to, to get killed in a car accident, die such a meaning, meaningless death, I think the industry was just shaken up completely, you know? Yokoi's legacy lives on in his creations. And Nintendo continues to build on his greatest invention. Nintendo had been working on color Game Boys for many, many years before the color Game Boy actually came out. They had a policy, quite rightly, that they wouldn't release a color system until they could uh, have almost as good battery life as their black and white system. But color isn't the only innovation for the Game Boy. I think that one of the other things that has contributed to the success of the Game Boy has been matching great software titles with the, the different platforms. I mean, with Game Boy Color, that came out and we were able to launch that essentially with uh, the Pokemon games. Pokemon was a phenomenal success and an amazing game, perfect for the Game Boy. Pokemon. Uh, They're great games and I think they really helped uh, draw audiences in and convince them to buy the hardware. The success of Pokemon puts a Game Boy in the hands of nearly every kid in America. But Nintendo is already thinking about the next step. Nintendo actually had, it was called Project Atlantis. That, that was the original code name for uh, the Game Boy Advance. It was actually ready a lot longer before they released it, but they didn't want to release it because the Game Boy Color was selling so well. By June 11, 2001, Nintendo is finally ready to release the next generation Game Boy to the masses. It only takes four days for the new system to sell more than half a million units at just $99 a piece. Game Boy Advance is good to hold. Pretty much anyone can buy the Game Boy Advance, and we've really tried to take the technological capabilities of Game Boy and improve upon them while keeping them within reach of the average consumer. The Game Boy family has a new addition, a new screen-lighted flip design model we're calling Game Boy Advance SP. On March 23, 2003, Nintendo releases a redesigned Game Boy Advance. In just one year, 6.5 million units of the new handheld are sold. Well, the Game Boy Advance SP, of course, is the culmination of 14 years of great uh, Game Boy fun. It's front-lighted, it's got a rechargeable battery, it's got everything game players have been asking for. In 2003, Gunpei Yokoi's accomplishments are honored at the Game Developer's Choice Awards. For lifetime achievement. If my father were able to attend the ceremony, the joy that I could feel as his son would have been something no words of mine could ever express. To him, and thank my father in heaven, to whom I have an ever-increasing feeling of love and respect. Thank you. Nintendo continues to push the envelope of portable game design with the DS. That this is not a replacement for Game Boy. For Nintendo, DS is an interesting experiment. The future for Game Boy is the Game Boy is going to get smaller and cheaper. In the past, there's been other handheld systems that have better technology, but for one reason or another, GBA just like has plowed through them all and like totally dominated. 
Today, the Game Boy series of handheld systems have sold more than 160 million units worldwide. Other companies are trying to challenge its dominance, like Sony's PSP. But there's no denying that Nintendo's handheld is the most successful portable game system in history. Nine serious competitors have made a run at Game Boy in the past 15 years, but nine have failed. Game Boy doesn't just lead the handheld gaming market, it owns it. It all started with Easter eggs. Before you know it, I couldn't get enough of God mode. When I don't punch him in, I, I get a little weak. I thought you were supposed to go backwards in Pitfall. I can't even make it through two levels without infinite ammo. I can't remember a time when I didn't use codes. They made up the codes, I just used them. No one's gonna find out. <sighs> get the latest cheat codes and walk through strategies for Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. All right, so homie, let's see if you got what it takes. Cheat season premiere, tomorrow night at 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific.